Hello everyone and welcome to this act of worship. It's wonderful to have you here to worship virtually with us this week. Welcome to you wherever you are, whether you're in Heswall or in Thornton Huff, whether you're on the Wirral or somewhere else altogether. It's great to uh, have you here worshipping with us at whatever time or, or place you might be at. The, uh, the news this week is that here in Merseyside, new local restrictions are going to apply from Tuesday. So from Tuesday, it will not be permitted to socialise with another household in a private house or garden within Merseyside. And of course that includes the uh, Wirral Council area. So it won't be possible, unfortunately, to go to somebody else's house for a, a cup of tea, even if you sit in the garden. There are restrictions on uh, restaurants and pubs and what times they can open, and people are being asked not to use public transport for non-essential journeys. So that's the situation. That's from the BBC News website, by the way, so I hope that it is accurate. But we haven't yet seen all the, uh, the details from the government. So we're not yet sure how this will affect the life of the church, but we will, of course, let you all know in due course. I'm sat here, as you'll mostly know, in the church here at Heswall, and I'm sat in front of our Easter resurrection window. I hope you can see there the, uh, the empty tomb with the stone rolled away, showing us that Jesus is not there in the tomb because Jesus is risen. And that, of course, is a reminder that we, we worship each week the, the risen Jesus. And we're going to do that now by coming before God in prayer. We start with some words from Psalm 105. Give thanks to the Lord. Call on his name. Make known his deeds among the peoples. Sing to him. Sing praises to him. Tell of all his wonderful works. Glory in his holy name. Let the hearts of those who seek the Lord rejoice. Seek the Lord and his strength. Seek his presence continually. Remember the wonderful works he has done, his miracles and the judgments he uttered. And so we pray. This morning or afternoon or evening, let us come before our almighty and loving God. We bring ourselves to worship just as we are. And we know that you know each one of us. We bring our joy and our gratitude, our happiness and contentment, but we also bring our concerns and our troubles, our pain and our sufferings. And so we give thanks for all of our blessings and we pray for strength to face our difficulties. Lord, we bring before you the burdens that we carry, knowing that you have promised us rest from them. And we bring the wider burdens of our world. We bring grief and sadness and pray for comfort for ourselves and for others. But we also bring to you our gratitude and thanks for all of the good things that we enjoy, for the gifts of life, love and fellowship, and of course for the gift of your Son Jesus Christ, who was born for us, who died and rose again. We give thanks that you can transform sorrow into joy, that you can overcome even death, and that you will always listen and be there for us when we call. The Lord says, incline your ear and come to me. Listen so that you may live. Thanks be to God. And yet we acknowledge there are times when we have placed our own interests ahead of your calling. 
times when we have made mistakes, times when we have not acted, when we know that we should have done. If we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, God, who is faithful and just, will forgive us. And so may the God of mercy, who forgives us all our sins through Jesus Christ, strengthen us in all goodness by the power of the Holy Spirit and keep us in eternal life. And Lord, grant us the compassion we need to forgive others and to grow always in grace, love and understanding. We ask this in the name of Jesus Christ, who even in his suffering forgave his oppressors and taught us all the great depth and strangeness of his love. Amen. We bring our prayers together in the words of the Lord's Prayer, and this week we're using the more modern form. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us in the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power and the glory are yours now and forever. Amen. From Matthew chapter 20, starting at the first verse. For the kingdom of heaven is like a landowner who went out early in the morning to hire labourers for his vineyard. After agreeing with the labourers the usual daily wage, he sent them into his vineyard. When he went out about nine o'clock, he saw others standing idle in the marketplace and he said to them, You also go to the vineyard and I will pay you whatever is right. 
So they went. When he went out again about noon and about three o'clock, he did the same. And about five o'clock, he went out and found, found others standing around. And he said to them, why are you standing here idle all day? And they said to him, because no one has hired us. And he said to them, you also go into the vineyard. When evening came, the owner of the vineyard said to his manager, call the labourers and give them their pay, beginning with the last and then going to the first. When those hired about five o'clock came, each of them received the usual daily wage. Now when the first came, they thought they would receive more, but each of them also received the usual daily wage. And when they received it, they grumbled against the landowner, saying, These last worked only one hour, and you have made them equal to us, who have borne the burden of the day and the scorching heat. But he replied to one of them, Friend, I am doing you no wrong. Did you not agree with me for the usual daily wage? Take what belongs to you and go. I choose to give the last the same as I give to you. Am I not allowed to do what I choose with what belongs to me? Or are you envious because I am generous? So the last will be first, and the first will be last. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Amen. This is a parable that I've struggled with over the years. If I'm honest, it's not one of my favourite parables. It's one that I find still quite difficult to come to terms with. We talked about this on our Wednesday night Bible study group on Zoom on Wednesday, and we had a really, really good discussion about it with the different ideas and, and, and different approaches, which was great. Imagine you've been hired in the morning... And you've agreed a daily wage, but you don't have any power to negotiate a better wage. You've got to just take what's being offered. And you're offered the sum of one denarius, which was the going rate for a day's work in that time and place. It's not a generous wage. Maybe it's enough to feed your family that evening. It's not like you can turn around and ask for more, because there are other unemployed workers quite willing to take your place if you say no. So you agree to work for one denarius in the vineyard all day, and you toil hard all day. You do, presumably, hard, heavy manual labour right through the day in the hot sun. And you get to the end of the day, and you know there are other people who have only been employed for a few hours, or even just one hour at the end of the day. And those people get paid first, and you learn that the person who's been hired at five o'clock and has only done an hour's work, has probably just turned up and helped tidy up at the end, gets the same amount of money as you when you've toiled hard and worked hard all day. I think that it's almost a universal human reaction to say that's not fair. We expect that if we work hard, we get a reward for it. We expect that reward and effort should somehow be linked. I think that's really ingrained in how we think. And it is ingrained in our economic system. That's how things work. And yet we're supposed to believe that this is about God, that this landowner, owner of this vineyard, who owns the means of production and controls things, that this is generosity, giving more to these people who haven't done the work. Well, maybe that's right. Maybe all these people, even if they have only worked a short time, which is not their fault because they just haven't been hired by anybody else. They can all feed their children that night. They can all go to bed satisfied, having eaten their daily bread. But it's still a curious story. Now, the way in which this is generally understood is that, indeed, the owner of the vineyard represents God. And the wage which they are given represents God's love, God's grace, what we are given 
by God. And that's not a thing that you can divide. You can't have a little bit of God's grace. God can't love you a little bit. It's not in God's nature to do that. Um, And so everyone is going to get the same reward. Because God's love, if you like, is digital and not analogue. It's either there or it's not. It's one or zero. There aren't gradations uh, through a scale. You can't separate the love of God into small pieces and give some to some people and others not. It's not something that we can earn or deserve. It's simply a gift. That's an amazing thought, isn't it? And it's hard to come to terms with that. And it's one of those things, I think, if we think we fully understand it, then we've we've misunderstood because it's so far beyond and so different to how we run and and operate our world. Um, I was thinking back the first time that I ever led a service about this. At that time, I I worked for the Information Commissioner's Office. I was a civil servant, and as it happened, I was a trade union rep. And I do remember thinking that if this happened in a a workplace where I was a trade union rep, the union would be uh, out on the streets, I think, almost immediately. That probably wasn't an option for workers in uh, first century Palestine. So there are troubling things about this story. And I understand that it's a, it's a metaphor and we can push the metaphor too far. But it seems that, is a denarius really a good wage? It's just the going wage. It's what people get. It's like earning the minimum wage now in our society. It's it's maybe enough to get by, but, but, but only just. And it seems that whether or not these people get a wage is dependent on whether this landowner chooses to give it to them or not. There must be other people who went to work for other people that morning through no fault of their own and maybe got paid less. Other people who didn't get given the job. That strikes me again as curious. So... I think it's a parable that I find hard to fit the metaphor in with the story that it's telling us about God. I'm not disputing the wonderful, fantastic good news about God's love for us. And of course, we know that Jesus is going to go on to sacrifice himself on the cross and and be resurrected for all of us. Absolutely. But as a metaphor, it it still troubles me. Because it's not about changing the system. This unfair system where the landowner has all the power and the workers have no power and have to just accept whatever they're given. That's not changed as a result of this. And I think we have to ask questions like that in our own world now. It is a wonderful thing that people are willing to give away their own resources, their own money that they have often worked hard to to earn. It's good that they're willing to give that away to charity. That's a wonderful thing that we should celebrate. Whether that's somebody who has very little choosing to give away what little they have, and we could could think of the story of the widow's mite, or maybe it's somebody, and the obvious example is Bill Gates, who has earned an awful lot of money, more money than anyone could possibly ever need, and has chosen to give away a lot of it in the pursuit of good causes, uh, particularly tackling malaria in Africa, which is a, uh, a wonderful cause to have done. And it's much better that people give away their money in for charitable causes than that they don't. But we need to ask the question about why is that necessary in the first place and what, why, are we, why do we have an economic system that allows these people to get so rich in the first place? When we give food to the food bank which I hope that if you've been doing that regularly, you're still being able to do that um, during this, uh, this time when things are more difficult. We give money or food directly to the food bank. That's fantastic. That's a wonderful act of Christian generosity. But we should also be asking, what is wrong with our society that this is necessary in the first place? We shouldn't be accepting it as normal. In a sense, though, this is a parable that is about saying you're not going to get a reward because we have to look back at the end of the final, the the previous chapter, the end of chapter 19, when Peter asks Jesus a question and 
and says, look, what, what are we going to get out of this? We've, we've given stuff up. We've become your followers. What are we going to get out of it? Um, and Jesus says that many who are first will be last and the last will be first. So the answer is that even if you're a follower of Jesus and you do everything perfectly, you're not going to get any more than anybody else. That's challenging for us, isn't it? There's still an idea that somehow, if you're a Christian, if you're good, if you follow the rules, you're going to get your reward. You're going to be, you're one of the good people, and you're going to get something out of it. And unfortunately, that's not what Jesus promises us. Because as we've said, we can't divide God's love. God doesn't love us in the church more than God loves anybody else. God loves everybody equally. And that's still impossible for us. I think, to get our heads around. So, on a spiritual level, this is a wonderful parable about God's grace. It's amazing, it's fantastic, but I think it's also challenging, and on an economic level, I want to ask lots and lots of questions. What is amazing is this is a story that was told 2,000 years ago, recorded in the Gospels. And we can still have fantastic, detailed conversations about it 2,000 years later. That's an amazing thing as well. So let's not complain that other people have more than us. And another way to read it is that it is an attack on privilege. It's an attack on people saying, well, we, we think that we're special. We want more. Let's celebrate God's love. But let's also ask difficult questions about the world we live in and how we can build God's kingdom, which is a place of justice and joy. Amen. Praise the Lord.
So we come to our prayers of intercession, where we will pray for, for ourselves, for our, our world, our community, our family and friends, and all of those who need God's help. So let us pray. Loving God, we have so much to thank you for. And yet we know that people suffer in this life through no fault of their own. And so we remember this morning everyone who is suffering in many different ways, physically, spiritually, emotionally. We think of those like the workers in the story who are not given a job. We think of all of those who have, have lost their jobs as a result of the pandemic. We think of people unemployed or on people on contracts which don't give them enough, enough work to get by. And we remember that too often ours is a world of poverty. A place where abundant natural resources are not shared out fairly. A place where the profits go to a few while the work is done by many. And yet, Lord, the kingdom of God is justice and peace. Lord, help us to build your kingdom here on earth. Eternal, ever-living and ever-present God, we pray amid the struggles and the joys of this day, we pray for those who are overburdened, weighed down, demoralised, those who feel fearful or desolate. Of course, we think of those affected by the ongoing pandemic. We think of other problems in our world. Those troubled in mind and spirit who find no peace. Those who are alone and lonely without friend or comfort. Those who are frightened and bewildered. People who can see no direction or purpose in their lives. Lord, we pray for your kingdom of justice and peace to come. We pray for a world in which everyone can live life to its fullest, as you promised us. So Lord, we pray for our family and friends, for our own local communities. And we pray for everyone who this week is facing new restrictions on what they can do and, and who they can see. People here in Wirral and across the United Kingdom. We pray for our, our church fellowships, for Heswell URC and for St George's. We pray for those close to us and those far away. And we remember, Lord, to pray for ourselves. We know that you told us to love our neighbour as ourselves. And to do that, we must first love ourselves. So, Lord, we pray that you will help us to look after ourselves. In trial and tribulation, God of comfort, be near us. In loss and devastation, God of grief, grieve with us. In uncertainty and confusion, God of the way, show us your path. In want and in need, God of provision, provide for us. In comfort, and enjoy, God of love, let us not forget you. So Lord, we bring all of our prayers before you, and everything we ask, we ask in the name of Jesus Christ, who died on the cross and rose to leave behind the empty tomb. Amen.
So we've come nearly to the end of another service of our worship for this week. As I think I forgot to say at the beginning, although I may by this time have edited in at the beginning, so in fact I did say it at the beginning, no or not by this point, we are going to be celebrating harvest shortly, I think in two weeks' time, although things are slightly fluid at the moment. So as I have asked before, if you are able to provide any images of something that you have harvested, or perhaps a short video, or it could be you talking, or it could be a video or a photo of something you have harvested, however you want to interpret that, whether it's what you've literally harvested in your garden, or whether it's things that you have harvested more sort of generally in life, that would be fantastic. And also think about if you're able to make a gift in some form to one of the, or more of the charities that we would usually support. So uh, both churches have in the past supported the Wirral Food Bank, uh, the Charles Thompson Mission, uh, and last year we were involved in the Arclight project, uh, the Wirral Ark, it's a homeless shelter. Um, so if you are able to make a donation for this harvest to one of those charities or, or a different charity of your choice, please think about whether you're able to do that and in what form that may take. But uh, that will be coming up. More details will be available soon. And so we finish as we, we started in prayer and we ask for God's blessing. Lord, in the weeks, days to come, Give us a way to go, a path to follow, a purpose to fulfil, and a meaning to all our deeds. And may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all evermore. Amen.